in the in the Christian culture um, that I grew up in, the gospel sort of hung around in the background. It was sort of the religious wallpaper in the room. The the churches that um, my family were members of um, had the true gospel. It was not anything heterodox or anything like that. It was not. Um, a false gospel or social gospel. It, it was the true gospel, but it was a gospel not fully embraced, I think. It was a good news that was reserved only for the unbeliever, the gospel for lost people. And then once you received this good news, once you put your faith in Christ Jesus, the idea was you kind of move on to deeper things. And the deeper things in the church cultures that I grew up in, it could be a variety of things. It depended on the church, depending on the, the you know, context and, and, and even, the, um, you know, even the years. You know, there was a number of years where the deeper things for our church consisted of sort of eschatological ruminations, the timing of the Lord's return with lots of charts and graphs and movies and all sorts of things. Then deeper things were things about, you know, Calvinism versus Arminianism, that kind of dichotomy that Dan talked about last night. But never did it appear that the deep things might be actually the old story of what Christ has accomplished on the cross and out of the grave. So in my 20s, when my life fell apart and in the midst of that muck, I'm trying to sort through where I stand with God, even as someone who believed the gospel as a child. I was sent into a pronounced period of depression and despair, um, suicidal thoughts, just trying to sort out who I was and, and, and if I mattered to God. And it was in the midst of that period uh, an almost deadly period for me, that by God's grace, I discovered that the gospel was for me, that the gospel was for Christians too. Don't take that for granted if you are in a tradition where this is part of the vernacular, part of the training. It, it, it was not for me. I discovered that the gospel was for those who had once received it. And in that moment, a kind of grace awakening, a door was open to a universe of blessings that I always had access to, but never knew to kind of step through. In December 1951, C.S. Lewis wrote a letter to his friend, the priest Giovanni Calabria, in which he described a similar experience. He writes, during the past year, a great joy has befallen me. Difficult though it is, I shall try to explain this in words. It is astonishing that sometimes we believe that we believe what really, in our heart, we do not believe. For a long time, I believed that I believed in the forgiveness of sins. But suddenly, on St. Mark's Day, April 25th, this truth appeared in my mind in so clear a light that I perceived that never before and after many confessions and absolutions, had I believed it with my whole heart. Well, after the great joy had befallen me, I began, of course, to see the expansiveness of the gospel all over the scriptures, and certain texts became very precious to me. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, in the first four verses there, where Paul gives us the nutshell of the good news that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. But he says something really curious and, and really um, brief that we might just sort of gloss over it. He says, I want to remind you about this gospel, which I delivered to you. He says, you received it, past tense, and that was kind of the sense of the gospel that I had grown up with. I received it. But then he says, you're standing in it, present tense, in which you stand. And then he says, and by which you are being saved, present future tense. That was my first sort of textual, biblical indication that the good news is bigger than I thought it was. I had the received past tense, but I was just now beginning to see that 
every given day of my life, I stand under the good news of Christ Jesus, that the imputation of his righteousness is my validation, is my ongoing justification. And in fact, the work of sanctification in my life, the being saved, is powered by the good news as well. It's powered by grace, that it's all of grace. Think of John chapter 1, where we are told that Jesus Christ himself, from his fullness, we receive grace upon grace. He is a fountain, always flowing, of glad tidings, of great joy. Titus chapter 2, where Paul says it's the epiphany of grace that trains us to live godly lives. If I didn't know that that verse was in the Bible, and someone had asked me, what is it that trains us to live godly lives, to repent of ungodliness, and to live upright and righteously? I would come up with some variation of the law. How do you live a, you know, a godly life? How do you get trained for that? Well, you tell people what to do. Paul says, no, it's the appearance of grace that trains us to do that. So it was like putting um, corrective lenses on for the first time. It was a, a bigger and better transformation then, but a similar one to the first time I ever read a C.S. Lewis essay. I had read as a child the Chronicles of Narnia, but the first time I read a nonfiction, my Grammy had given to me this book um, called God in the Dock, which is the name of an essay, but it's a collection of essays as well, when I was in high school. And in Myth Became Fact... Lewis connected some important dots for me related to spirituality and art and literature that really shaped my understanding of Christian apologetics, first of all, but as, even of like Christian writing and artistry in general. And so now I began employing a different analogy to make sense of my burgeoning gospel centrality. I began to see the gospel as a wardrobe, but not just any wardrobe, a, a Narnian wardrobe. The gospel is like a Narnian wardrobe. So it's simple, it's definable. You see the outline of the wardrobe. You know what it is. You know what it's for. You can see what it does. You can um, put your arms on it. Maybe if it's big, you can't put your arms around it. But you, you, you can grasp it in some sense. Even a child can open up a wardrobe and step inside but once you're in there, at least in the Narnian wardrobe, you discover there's an entire universe that cannot be seen from the outside. A whole other world. The Narnian wardrobe is like that. And it's similar um, in the last battle, there is Aslan's barn. Do you remember in Aslan's barn, they say, it's bigger on the inside than it is on the outside. Augustine once said of God's grace, I have seen the depths, but I cannot find the bottom. That's what the gospel is like. It's bigger than we expect. It's more versatile than we think, and it's more powerful than we ever know. So what I would, thought I would do this morning is, is examine some of the various facets, the gifts of grace that we receive by faith in Christ and his finished work, and then touch a little bit at each point on what Lewis had to say about those facets, mainly from the Narnia stories, but, but not limited to those. And we'll begin our look at these facets by looking at, at Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 13. If, if you have a Bible or, or maybe a Bible app, you could, you could turn there, because I'm going to keep referring back to it here and there. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 through 13. This passage is going to serve as, as sort of our, our table of contents on a look at the Narnian gargantuanness of the gospel. So Ephesians 1, beginning in verse 3. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ for himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he lavished on us in the beloved one. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, that he richly poured out on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time 
to bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. In him we have also received an inheritance because we were predestined according to the plan of the one who works out everything in agreement with the purpose of his will so that we who had already put our hope in Christ might bring praise to his glory. In him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. This is God's word. There is a treasure trove here, just as Peter tells us in his first epistle, that the gospel comes with glories, subsequent glories, plural. Here, Paul tells us that we have been blessed, verse 3, with every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. Or, as in Romans 8.32, He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? All things. So the gospel is not a one-note thing. It is one song, but it has many notes in it. And the most prominent one is, firstly, the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins, the, the leading edge of the gospel's glory to us is justification by grace alone through faith alone. That the record of debt against us would be canceled, that our iniquities would be pardoned, that we would be declared blameless, innocent, despite the reality of our guilt before a just and holy God. This is the first astounding miracle of the gospel. In him, verse 7, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. The forgiveness of sins is probably the most prominent feature of Lewis's treatment of grace, and for good reason, of course. Justification is the heart of the true Christian faith. In that letter to Giovanni Calabria, Lewis wrote, Jesus has canceled the handwriting that was against us. Lift up our hearts. In Mere Christianity, Lewis says, the central Christian belief is that Christ's death has somehow put us right with God and given us a fresh start. Now, quite puzzlingly, at least to me, Lewis demurs on taking any particular stand on, quote, theories of the atonement. And he basically says, nobody needs to know how the atonement works in order to believe in and receive that atonement. Um, in fact, he, he says in mere Christianity, theories about Christ's death are not Christianity. And I suppose in one sense he's right, but I still think it's a weird thing for someone like Lewis to say. <laughs> I mean, he's a, he's a sharp thinker. You'd think he would have put some thought into this and been a little more clear. Of course, these are radio addresses. Mere Christianity is based, is based on radio addresses. And I think he has a, um, there's a purpose he has in them that sometimes Christian readers uh, you know, is that cross purposes with what Christian readers bring to the book. Um, we're looking for like a systematic theology, and that's really not what he's doing. But the clearest view of how the atonement works from Lewis's understanding of grace is likely the substitution of Aslan for Edmund in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Simple enough for children to pick up on. I see what he's doing there. I know what that story's about. The depiction in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe is some version of the ransom theory. And this seems to be, if Lewis camps out on a particular theory of atonement, it is the ransom theory. In fact, he, um, as we just heard, names a whole character after ransom in the Space Trilogy. As I said, children can figure out what's happening in the story. Aslan is going in Edmund's place. He is going to die in order to set Edmund free. And Edmund is the, the Judas of the group. In fact, he's the, the, um, the designated sinner. He has betrayed the um, kingdom. He has betrayed Aslan. And Lewis takes a lot of heat for this depiction, even in this child story, um, because he has Aslan submitting his life as a ransom to the witch, to the white witch. And critics say this take on the ransom theory of the atonement suggests that Christ is somehow satisfying the enemy, satisfying the wrath of the devil, 
in his substitutionary sacrifice. When biblically speaking, Christ is not satisfying the devil, but the wrath of God himself. That is propitiation. And I understand the concern. Um, in some sense, I, I, I guess maybe I share it a little bit. Um, I've, even though I, I, I find it somewhat odd, I don't want to derive an entire theology out of a work of fiction, right? And say, Lewis clearly believed X because of something he wrote in a children's story. I think there's more nuance there than the children's story um, often gives uh, him credit for. But remember, even in the story, Aslan rebukes the witch's sighting of the deep magic. She's very adamant. I am owed this kill, this, this blood debt. And Aslan sort of plays along with that and in a sense looks like he's affirming that. But when she begins to cite the deep magic as the grounding for her right, he rebukes her. I was there when the deep magic was written. What might this indicate to us? Well, the rules that the witch is trying to enforce, Aslan is saying, I wrote those, which I think is similar to the biblical portrait of evil attempting victory at Golgotha while only sealing its own doom. Haman, in effect, being hung on his own gallows. The enemy may have thought he was prevailing in the suffering of Christ, but the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, when the deep magic was written, was ironically conquering those who killed him. As Luther says, even the devil is the Lord's devil. And of course, it's not inappropriate to speak of Christ's blood setting us free from the bondage of evil. That's a biblical category anyway. Ephesians 2 makes that clear, among other passages. The atonement theory known as Christus Victor, that at the cross Christ conquers the principalities and powers, is a biblical view of the atonement. It's not the only facet of the atonement, and it's not even Lewis's only perspective on the atonement, but it is a biblical one. The second facet of the gospel that we can look at is this, union with Christ, union with Christ. If forgiveness of sins is the leading edge of the glory of the gospel, union with Christ may in fact be the center of it. All of the benefits we receive from Christ's work come from our being mystically united to Christ's person. Jesus references the promise of the believer's spiritual union with himself in his high priestly prayer, John chapter 17. I in them and they in me that we may be completely one, even as you and I are one, Father. The epistles mention it explicitly and implicitly so many times to the point that it could be seen, union with Christ can be seen as the central theme of salvation in the New Testament. So here in Ephesians 1, we see the doctrine of union with Christ reflected in the repetition of the phrasing in him, which is an indication of Union. Every time you see in him or in Christ, you are to think union with Christ. It's not just a handy way to sign off an email, right? In him. You should think union with Christ. Verse 3, in Christ. Verse 4, in him. Verse 6, in the beloved one. Verse 7, in him. Verse 9, in Christ. Verse 10, in Christ and in him. Verse 11, in him. Verse 12, in Christ. Verse 13, in him. Are you getting the picture? These are all shorthand indicators of the Christians being what Paul calls elsewhere, hidden with Christ in God. Of our being placed inside the life of Christ and of Christ's life being placed inside of us in Mere Christianity's chapter on new men, Lewis refers to this as the result of a good infection. He says, I've called Christ the first instance of the new man. But of course, he is something much more than that. He is not merely a new man, one specimen of the species, but the new man. He is the origin and center and life of all the new men. He came into the created universe of his own will, bringing with him the zoe, the new life. And he tra transmits it, not by heredity, but by what I have called the good infection. Everyone who gets it, gets it by personal contact with him. Other men become new by being in him. 
This new birth, the new life, the spirit-filled life comes from being placed by faith inside the life of Christ himself. And my favorite picture of this from Lewis, also from Mere Christianity, is this little bit on prayer. He says, an ordinary, simple Christian kneels down to say his prayers. He's trying to get in touch with God. But if he is a Christian, he knows that what is prompting him to pray is also God. God, so to speak, inside him. But he also knows that all his real knowledge of God comes through Christ, the man who was God. That Christ is standing beside him, helping him to pray, praying for him. Do you see what is happening? God is the thing to which he is praying, the goal he is trying to reach. God is also the thing inside him, which is pushing him on, the motive power. God is also on the road or the bridge along which he is being pushed to that goal so that the whole threefold life of the three personal being is actually going on in that ordinary little bedroom where an ordinary man is saying his prayers. In the Narnia stories, union with Christ seems to run, as it does here in Ephesians 1, more implicitly than explicitly. I think we see it in the recurring theme of Aslan swallowing people up, or even eating people, which is posed not just as a terrifying thing, but actually as a delicious thing, as a beautiful, as as a preferable thing. He says to, um, to Jill, In one of the stories, I have swallowed up entire empires, men, women, boys, girls. But in the horse and his boy, there is the talking horse, Wynne. And Wynne says to Aslan, please, you're so beautiful. You may eat me if you'd like. I'd sooner be eaten by you than fed by anyone else. In the Chronicles, the way Narnia and the outside world from time to time kind of seep back and forth into each other is maybe a reflection of Christ filling all things, Ephesians 4.10, bringing the fullness to bear of him who, Ephesians 1.23, fills all in all. And it's because of this union that we enjoy gifts of the gospel like adoption, which Paul also mentions. We won't spend much time on that, but But um, Lewis speaks about that, becoming children of God in mere Christianity. And certainly it is a a parallel theme in the Chronicles of Narnia. But it's also because of this union with Christ that we enjoy this next facet of the gospel. Thirdly, the gift of the Spirit. The gift of the Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit himself and the gifts of the Spirit that he gives to us are ours through union with Christ. Christ. The spirit and the gifts are ours through him who with us sideth, right? This is how Paul puts it here in Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14. In him you also were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and when you believed. The Holy Spirit is the down payment of our inheritance. With the spirit come his gifts. And I like the phrasing of verses 9 and 10. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure that he purposed in Christ as a plan for the right time. So this immediately made my mind go to the scene in The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe where Father Christmas shows up. Do you remember this scene? The land is thawing where it's always winter and never Christmas. And then suddenly Santa Claus shows up. He's like a John the Baptist for Aslan's arrival. But what he does for the children is more akin to what the Holy Spirit does. He gives them gifts, but not just any gifts. Santa Claus might bring toys and candy and things like that. In Narnia, Father Christmas brings gifts as a plan for the right time. They're tailored for each child and they're things that they will need as Aslan's plan unfolds, as the kingdom begins to come and continues to come. So Peter receives a sword and a shield. Susan receives a bow and arrow and a horn that will summon Aslan when blown. Lucy receives a dagger and a healing potion. It's not what you'd expect Santa Claus would give children. Here, kids, here are the weapons. Yeah. (laughs) These aren't ordinary Christmas gifts. These are gifts of the Spirit, a sword and shield, 
the gift of healing, the gift of prayer, summoning, speaking, calling out to God. The children will need these gifts in the battle against the white witch. They will need these gifts in the liberation and redemption of Narnia. They will need these gifts to serve and protect their brothers and sisters and all of their new Narnian kinsmen. These are gifts given according to the mystery of his will. Things that equip the saints for the building up of Aslan's kingdom and the very conquering of the gates of hell. And speaking of the conquering of hell, the the gospel through which we receive forgiveness of sins, union with God, and the gift and gifts of the Spirit also announces to us, fourthly, the restoration of all things. The restoration of all things. What is the plan? What is God's end game for the world? Well, Habakkuk chapter 2 tells us that the knowledge of his glory would cover the earth like the waters cover the sea. In Ephesians 1 verse 10, we have a, a little hint towards that. To bring everything together in Christ, both things in heaven and things on earth in him. The gospel's forecast is not some disembodied paradise out in the mythical ether. It's not simply, as, as I heard growing up, going to heaven when you die. It is that, but it's bigger than that. It is a wardrobe. You step inside and you see that the promise is that just as Christ opened the door to heaven in his resurrection that we might pass through, by the same door, heaven itself is coming our way. When the stone rolled away, more light streamed out than in. In his chapter on, on hope in mere Christianity, Lewis famously wrote, if I find in myself a desire which no experience in this world can satisfy, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Biblically speaking, this world is the new earth that will redeem our cursed earth. In Romans chapter 8, Paul says, all creation is groaning for redemption. As in birth pangs, he says. So it's not just death pangs. The old world is passing away, but there's a new world that's emerging, that's, that's coming to bear. And this new earth is emerging from Christ's intervention in history, inaugurating his kingdom. So in Lewis's worldview, this concept finds parallel in the medieval notion of the logris, which is the idea of a true and better. In particular, Lewis is envisioning a true and better England. That's the logris. There is a virtuous England, a glorious England, underneath the surface of this cursed England and deteriorating England. And the virtuous one will break through someday. So in the third book in the um, Space Trilogy, That Hideous Strength, um, he, he fully kind of pushes this logris idea. It's more fully fleshed out. It's seen in the reemergence, in, in one instance, of the wizard Merlin who suddenly shows up, somehow resurrected, into modern Britain. That's Lewis sort of looking back at sort of the Arthurian legends and like that's where there was chivalry, that's where there was honor, that's where there was dignity, that's where there was virtue. That world is a taste of the true and better world to come and it is emerging from the ground, from underneath us. There are metaphors for the new heavens and the new earth spoken of in the Bible's eschatological prophecies. It's looking forward to this world to come knowing that even within Narnia, there is the land of the emperor beyond the sea. And this drives uh, the brave mouse Reepachi in the voyage of the Dawn Treader to say this, while I can, I sail east in the Dawn Treader. And when she fails me, meaning the ship, the Dawn Treader, the ship, when she fails me, I paddle east in my coracle. And when she sinks, I shall swim east with my four paws. And when I can swim no longer, if I have not reached Aslan's country or shot over the edge of the world in some vast cataract, I shall sink with my nose to the sunrise. It's beautiful. Uh, on this passage, Randy Alcorn, who wrote a great book on heaven, by the way, that kind of helps us regather the biblical picture of heaven. On that passage with Reepicheep, Randy Arcorn says, Reepicheep doesn't long for Aslan's ghostly realm of cloudy nothingness. 
He longs to be with his king forever in that solid country with land, mountains, rivers, metals, plains, trees, animals, and people with physical bodies. The ground quakes under Aslan as he prowls. Aslan is real and tangible, and his flowing mane can be touched if you dare. Reepicheep loves Aslan not as a disembodied spirit, but as a tangible mighty lion, king of kings, ruler of Narnia, earth, and all worlds. Reepicheep longs to be in Aslan's country, for he longs for Aslan himself. And in the last battle, of course, which is um, the last book in the Chronicles of Narnia, Aslan shuts the door on the old Narnia and leads the faithful further up and further in to the truer and better land. But to live in the redeemed place forever, we need to be well suited for the journey, which leads to the fifth and final facet of gospel grace that we'll look at. Our resurrection to come. Our resurrection to come. To enter into the new world, we will need new bodies. And praise God, Christ's resurrection body is but the first fruits of our own. We believe not just in the resurrection of Christ, but in the resurrection, because of the resurrection of Christ, in the resurrection of the believer. The Holy Spirit is the down payment, verse 14, of our inheritance until the redemption of the possession to the praise of his glory. The redemption of the possession includes us. It is centrally us. He who began a good work in us, he will be faithful to complete it. We will be changed. The mortal will trade in for immortality. Lewis wrestled with this in a few key ways. And from this wrestling comes the speculation that he affirmed the reality of a kind of limbo state between heaven and earth, a kind of purgatory. Did Lewis believe in purgatory? I don't know. I, I don't think so, at least not in the formal Romanist sense. If he did, it was some variation, a spin on it. I, I don't think the evidence usually given for his belief in purgatory, uh, which is mainly, again, a work of fiction, The Great Divorce, a, a metaphorical narrative of The Great Divorce, and then a provocative line in Letters to Malcolm, chiefly on prayer, where he says, our, our souls demand purgatory. It's not clear to me that he's talking about the Roman Catholic view of an intermediate state of some kind. But he did know, I think what we can affirm, whatever Lewis believed about that, rightly or wrongly, he did know that you and I need to be prepared to enter the time when the glory of heaven finally subsumes the cursedness of earth. We can't get in like we are. Jerry Walls explains Lewis's view this way. In Lewis's view, purgatory exists not to satisfy God's sense of justice in punishing the unrepentant, like you need further whipping to get, you know, but rather to purify believers in preparation for their everlasting home in God's presence. Now, to be transparent, I don't agree even with Lewis's modified view as explained here, if that's truly what it is. Because biblically speaking, the word of the gospel is final. It is finished, Christ declared. The accomplishment needed to purify us for heaven was accomplished by the shed blood of Christ. And so to suggest some sort of intermediate state where we need to be further refined is like saying Christ's blood was not sufficient, not powerful enough. When we come to Christ in faith, we don't receive some kind of justification 1.0, right? We are justified totally forever. But I do appreciate Lewis wrestling with the need to be fully sanctified for the fully sanctified world. And I think his view of that is reflected in some various nuanced ways. So in the Pevensey children's first venture into Narnia, when it's still frozen under the spell of the white witch, do you remember what they do as they're passing through the wardrobe? They have to essentially get dressed for the environment. They put on the coats as they're walking through. They put on the fur coats. So they walk into the world equipped for warmth. And their very presence is a prophetic signal that Aslan is not far behind. They're fulfilling prophecy themselves, according to Mr. Beaver. What happens next? The world begins to thaw. 
It's as if they've brought warmth into the world with them. Time runs differently in Narnia, so while they're still children in the timeline outside of the wardrobe, they rise to the stature of men and women, regal kings and queens inside the wardrobe. They grow into the world they are entering. And the same is true for us. To run it the other way, those who reject Christ become smaller. In Lewis's view, perhaps even less human. I think we see that in Perlandra as Weston becomes in his descent into evil a, a, a new being called the unman. But as it pertains to our following Christ in his resurrection into the new earth to come, Lewis says things like, as you get older, Aslan will get bigger. And he portrays it as becoming more and more your truer self, your real self. If going the other way makes you less and less human, more beastly, then to go further up and further in is to become not less yourself, but more yourself, your true self, more human. He portrays it as becoming more and more, in the very real sense, your real self. Not more angelic or more quote-unquote spiritual, but more real. So I'll, I'll conclude with one of my favorite pictures of this preparation, one that I think speaks more to the purgatorial process of sanctification that every believer enjoys and, and endures at the same time, this side of heaven. It's from the Voyage of the Dawn Treader, where Eustace Scrub, who deserved his name, or almost deserved it, I think is the line. It's about as cuddly a personality as his name would suggest. He finds himself in a scaly predicament. Eustace comes across a great treasure and overcome with greed, he begins to imagine all the comforts of life that he could enjoy with this treasure. And he goes into hoarding mode to protect this at all costs. He becomes not just treasure-centered, but by becoming treasure-centered, becoming self-centered. And eventually he falls asleep. And when he wakes up, he discovers what? Does anyone remember? He's become a dragon. Well, why a dragon? He's become a beast, first of all. He's become not himself, his true self. He becomes a dragon. Well, dragons are hoarders. They have treasures that they're trying to protect. They're protecting their secret fortunes at all costs. But I also think physically they represent this kind of beastliness and this kind of self-protection, this sort of self-centered armor. They're heavy, scaly skin. They're covered in fleshly armor. And Eustace, of course, doesn't quite understand how he's gotten into this situation, and he becomes very afraid. Um, and he's in pain because he had put a gold bracelet on his arm, and when he turns into a dragon, his arm, of course, has gotten bigger, and now that gold bracelet is constricting him and causing him pain, which is what our idolatry will do to us. And he's cut off from humanity, just like our self-centeredness will do to us. And then Aslan comes, and Aslan leads Eustace the dragon to a garden, and in the garden there's a well, and Eustace, the dragon, somehow just knows if he could get into the water in the well, he will be healed. But he can't get in the way he is. He must be prepared for the well. So this is from the Voyage of the Dawn Tre Treader, Eustace Scrub speaking. He says, then the lion said, but I don't know if it spoke. You'll have to let me undress you. And I was afraid of his claws, I can tell you, but I was pretty nearly desperate now. So I just lay flat on my back, to let him do it. The very first tear he made was so deep, I thought it had gone right into my heart. And when he began pulling the skin off, it hurt worse than anything I've ever felt. The only thing that made me able to bear it was just the pleasure of feeling the stuff peel off. Do you know if you've ever picked the scab of a sore place, it hurts like Billy. Oh, but it is such fun to see it coming away. <laughs> a weirdo. <laughs> Eustace says, well, he peeled the beastly stuff right off, just as I thought I'd done it myself the other three times, only they hadn't hurt. And there it was, lying on the grass, only ever so much thicker and darker and more knobbly looking than the others had been. And there was I, smooth and soft as a peeled switch, and smaller than I had been. Then he caught hold of me, and I didn't like that much, for I was very tender underneath now that I had no skin on. And he threw me into the water. 
It smarted like anything, but only for a moment. After that, it became perfectly delicious. And as soon as I started swimming and splashing, I found that all the pain had gone from my arm. And then I saw why. I turned into a boy again. Brothers and sisters, the redemption of the possession will be complete. I am grateful, as I assume you are too, that God is turning us into real boys and girls. Christ the dragon killer is committed to the undragoning of his brothers and sisters. And when he finally returns to consummate his kingdom upon the earth, we will, as co-heirs with him, fully receive the redemption of our bodies, the gift of the resurrection for which he is the first fruit. Let me put it this way. I don't know about you, I can't wait to get undragoned. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gift of your word. We thank you for the word of grace. It speaks a better word. of Justice accomplished of work completed, of the end of all of our striving. And Father, the, the down payment, the promise that there will be an end to our pain, to our suffering, to our grief, to our doubt, to our confusion, and even to our sin. We thank you that that day is coming. We ask that you would come quickly, Lord Jesus. We pray all these things in his name, the name of Christ, amen.